Capitol Hill in Washington is again the nation's focal point as the 80th Congress convenes during one of the most crucial periods in the nation's history. The Republican-controlled Congress takes the helm in the House. Halleck of Indiana, in his role as majority leader, hands the gavel to Joe Martin of Massachusetts, first Republican speaker since 1931. Following the Republican landslide of 1946, the GOP now possesses a clear working majority in both branches of Congress. A short time after convening, the speaker takes his place and receives the applause of his colleagues. Mr. Martin is then sworn in to the high office that is his. He is faced by 430 members of the new house, whom he in turn swears in. It is among these men that many of the finance bills will originate, bills that will have a vital bearing on America's economy during the coming years. As does Senator-elect Bilbo, storm center of a controversy which raged over his seating and threatened for a time to block Senate organization a compromise deferred action on his case. The Capitol awaits the arrival of President Truman to deliver his message. He shakes hands with Senator Vandenberg, President Pro Tem of the Senate, and Speaker Martin, both presiding over the joint session. Each receives a copy of the President's address. Mr. Truman confronts a Congress heavily weighted by the opposition. He delivers his message on the State of the Union. In the effort to bring about a sound and equitable price structure, each group of our population has its own responsibilities. It is up to industry not only to hold the line on existing prices, but to make reductions whenever profits justify such action. It is up to labor to refrain from pressing for unjustified wage increases that will force increases in the price level. And it is up to government to do everything in its power to encourage high volume production. For that is what makes possible good wages, low prices, and reasonable profits. What we do or fail to do at home affects not only ourselves, but millions throughout the world. If we are to fulfill our responsibilities to ourselves and to other peoples, we must make sure that the United States is sound economically socially and politically. This is an age when unforeseen attack could come with unprecedented speed. We must be strong enough to defeat and thus forestall any such attack. For these reasons, we need well-equipped, well-trained armed forces, and we must be able to mobilize rapidly our resources in men and material for our own defense should the need arise. Let us have the will and the patience to do this job together. May the Lord strengthen us in our faith. May he give us wisdom to lead the peoples of the world in his ways of peace. In the cabinet room at the White House, the members meet with President Truman to discuss domestic and international problems. The newest appointee is George C. Marshall, the nation's Secretary of State. Robert Patterson guides our military affairs as Secretary of War. John W. Snyder, Secretary of the Treasury, holds the purse strings. Tom Clark handles legal affairs as Attorney General. James Forrestall continues as Secretary of the Navy. Robert E. Hannigan is Postmaster General, and Julius A. Krug serves as Secretary of the Interior. W. Averill Harriman, Secretary of Commerce, formerly Ambassador to Britain. Dr. John R. Steelman is Special Assistant to the President. And Louis B. Schwellenbach, Secretary of Labor. Clinton P. Anderson completes the group as Secretary of Agriculture. In his White House office, President Truman has a final conference with O. Max Gardner, newly appointed Ambassador to Britain. Formerly Under Secretary of the Treasury, the 64-year-old North Carolina industrialist is an expert on the international economic matters that form the basis of our relations with England. <laughs> 